right, good morning to you. We're going to open with a word of prayer here in just a moment, and um, I'll pray a long time and let people that are taking food down, I know we have some that are taking their food down and dropping that off and headed up, and so we'll give you a couple announcements first. How about that? That way they don't know what's going on, and you do. Uh, but if you would, take a look at your bulletin. I'll point out a couple things to you this morning, and then we'll open with a word of prayer, and then... Uh, sing a few songs together in a moment. But if you would, take a note on the back, the main uh, announcement need that we have at the moment. We've mentioned this for a couple services and have some of you that have volunteered. We need just a few more. Um, but if you would, see at the bottom there where it says Ways to Serve at Landmark. And uh, there's a three-year-old class. There's all in the kids' ministry. There's a three-year-old class. This would be a, a summer class, a temporary position. It's kind of transitioning kids from... Uh, the nursery into our kids' ministry, and it'd be a good time kind of during the summer months to do that. They'll be ready to head into those classes here in just a couple months, uh, but we need a three-year-old class teacher and helper on Sunday mornings, and so if you can help with that, that'd be a kind of a summertime uh, position. And at the bottom, you see there are evening kids club helper through the summer. We need some help with our evening kids clubs on Sunday evenings that start at 5, they go to about 6.30. And um, similar to our kids' clubs during the year, but we're trying to give a little bit of a break to those that have been working in those kids' clubs since August and let them be a part of some of our adult classes and groups. And uh, so if you can help with that, uh, that'd be on Sunday evenings throughout the summer months. And there's some different things, whether it's heading up games or teaching, helping. Uh, we also do a, like a little snack on Sunday evenings through the summer as well. And so if you can help with that. And then Kids Ministry Class Helpers, and this is on Sunday mornings, and we'd like to sort of start a rotational uh, group where we have a couple of different people helping for a month, and then they take a couple months off, and then they'd rotate back in, and so uh, trying to establish some of those uh, positions there in our kids ministry. And so if you would uh, take note of that, let us know if you can help, you can tell myself or let the office know either one, and over the next couple weeks we'll uh, let you know more and, and when and where you can help with those. And you see there on the inside with that, our Kids for Truth clubs that go throughout the school year, they are going to go two Sundays into June. We missed a few weeks through the winter for uh, weather and then a, a night or two that we had some sickness and different things. And so to make up that time, we're going to go two Sundays in June. Um, so that'll be finishing out the year. Uh, no evening groups or clubs tonight because of our uh, church cookout, so make sure you take note of that as well. And then some different events coming up uh, in the month of June. We have family game night. We have a missionary that's going to be uh, with us, a teen conference, Father's Day breakfast, a lot of different things going on, and an officer's meeting there at the end of the month. So if you would take note of each of those things and plan to be a part of them. We're glad that you're here this morning. I know we have a number of people that are able to get out and get away and travel and uh, starting vacations a little bit earlier this year, and we're excited for uh, excited for that. Somebody asked me this week, they said, does summer months bother you as a pastor? Because everybody, so many people leave and travel, and you never know who's going to be there and who's not. I am glad that our families get to get out and get away. I think over the last couple of years, um, you've seen that you take that for granted. Um, but I hope that if you do travel, that you get to enjoy that time with family. I'm excited for you. And in fact, I may just go with you and um, do that. I'll make that my summer ministry. I'll just vacation with each of our church families for a couple days each. I won't go the whole time, just a couple days each. And um, um, I hope that as you travel, you know, you'll let us know if we can help you. We can pray for you as far as safety and uh, know a lot coming up in the next couple months. Let's open the word of prayer this morning. And then actually to start today, we have an instrument a little different the norm. I hope that you'll pay attention to it. I think we're going to have the words up on the screen as Stephen plays. And he played this for a recital recently. But this is one of my favorite songs of the last few years. And uh, we may even be learning it as a congregational. So pay close attention to it. It comes from, uh, the idea about it comes from Revelation 5. Um, and so I hope that you'll pay attention, be ministered to. And then we'll sing together in just a moment. Father, thank you for bringing us together this morning. I'm thankful for these people uh, that have gathered together to worship today. Um, but without you, our worship is nothing. It's not worship. It's just words and noise and song. So we ask that your Holy Spirit would fill us 
uh, that it would draw our minds and our hearts um, to be attentive to you, to live for you, to uh, live in you, to find our identity and uh, to find our person in you, in Christ, as you have worked in us and changed us. And so today, help us to take what we do for the next few minutes and know that it is, it is important, uh, that it is what you have called us to do as people, to glorify you, to lift your name up, to praise you, and uh, to let our minds and hearts, if you would, go on high for a moment and, and to sing and to rejoice and then uh, to obey, to obey your word, to see what it instructs us and how it teaches us and then how we can change and become more like you. So we ask that you'd bless today. Be with the many that are uh, traveling and, and able to go visit family or head on vacation. We are. We're excited for that. Thankful. Uh, I pray that as our church takes vacations and travels and does different things throughout this summer months, and uh, that even in that, that the rest that we find would be rest that points our souls to you, that the all that we see from wherever we may visit, the different things that we may get to experience, that all of it would point us to you. And uh, we praise you and glorify you for who you are, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As you're seated this morning, if you would, take your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter number 5. Matthew chapter number 5. If you're a guest with us this morning, we are glad to have you with us. And there's a Bible in front of you there in the seat in front of you most likely. If you don't have one with you this morning, you're welcome to use that today. If you don't have a Bible that's your own, you're welcome to take that with you. We'd love for that to be our gift for you today. And whatever brings you our way, we're glad that you are here. Uh, we have some special guests, I guess you'd call them, well, they're not really guests, but some college students that have made their way back, and we're excited uh, for that, and uh, Chris is back from West Point, and he's going to be going back, and when he goes back, he's going to be taking two siblings with him, eventually, he's got two siblings, Megan and Hudson, headed to uh, West Point as well, so I'm proud of each of them, and then a few of our uh, college students are back, and some that are back with an extra sheet of paper that says that they did a good job in college and they don't have to go back if they don't want to after this. And so we're excited for them. And then uh, Danny and Sarah Mall, oh, there they are. They crept in the back. Dan and Sarah Mall are with us uh, this morning. More importantly, they bear good tidings that a little baby is on the way. And so we're excited, excited for them. They uh, moved back to Tennessee area. Sarah's from that area, but... Uh, Danny served here for a long time in our ministry, so we're glad they're here with us uh, this morning as well. If you would, look at Matthew chapter number 5. Matthew chapter number 5. And uh, we've been here for a couple weeks, and um, I have this tendency when we first start into a section to feel like we stalled out. I can actually drive a manual car fairly well, uh, but you wouldn't know it by how we start to study certain books, because it feels like we start and then we have to stop and restart and stop and restart, and it's going to feel like that for a couple of weeks here as we start into the book of Matthew, but we are in chapter 5, and uh, I would say that's pretty good. We're on Sermon 6 in chapter 5, but you remember we, we started in chapter 4, because we had already done the first three earlier this year, so we've had six sermons so far over the first chapter and a half. It will pick up, I promise, but the Lord unloads a lot on us here in this first few verses of his teaching of his public and earthly ministry. You remember back in chapter 4, Jesus comes on the scene publicly. He's baptized by John the Baptist, who has been preaching what message? Repent and believe, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then it says in chapter 4 that John the Baptist is really arrested fairly quickly after it seems that Jesus is baptized and begins his public ministry. And then it says in verse number 17 that from that time on, Jesus began to preach and say what? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So Jesus has begun preaching and teaching his earthly ministry, the three or so years that he's going to live on this earth and try to expound and teach us what it is that God really is doing in this world, what He desires of us and 
what He wants to do in us. And He gathers this group of people, not those that are royal and those that are quote-unquote important, but He calls for fishermen in chapter 4. And then in the end of chapter 4, it says He went through all Syria. He brought unto Him all the sick, those with diseases, torments, possessed with devils, those that were lunatic, had the palsy, and He healed them. And a great multitude began to follow Him. So he pulls, and we talked about that in the last couple of weeks, he pulls those that seem unlikely and he preaches to them this new message that they are not blessed because of how their life has panned out or the circumstance of their life. They're not blessed because they're important, which is what they have been taught for most of their lives. But why are they blessed? We're going to go back. You say, we've already done this. Do you not remember? We're going to read it because... It's going to introduce our text for today. Our, our sermon today is one verse from one verse. It's a simple, uh, a simple message this morning. But that one verse is tied to what we've studied over the last couple weeks. So let's look there. Verse number 2 of chapter 5. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, don't get tired of the redundancy here. I think it's good for us to learn these and memorize these and know these. He says, blessed, blessed by God, are the poor in spirit. He said that's those that recognize their, their need, uh, the need of their soul. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. For they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Now here's our one verse for today, verse 13. And uh, you may, however your Bible is broken up, you may have a little title there that says the salt of the earth or salt and light, something along those lines. And don't let that little title that's inserted there fool you. That's just there to help your brain break up where we are in the passage. Verse 13 is directly tied to those Beatitudes that we just read. So he says, blessed are all these people. And then speaking of them, who's he speaking to? These ones that are blessed. He says, the poor in spirit, the meek, the mourning, the merciful, the peacemakers, the pure in heart, those that are persecuted. Here's who he's addressing in verse 13. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savor, have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. Lord, help us this morning as we look at this passage. Um, we have looked at these beatitudes and the blessings that you have laid on those that are undeserving and those that have great need. And so now you have called us to be the salt and the light of the earth. And uh, you have laid your blessing on us, and with that blessing becomes, comes the responsibility to live our lives in a way that impacts those around us. And so we ask that you teach us, guide us, and direct us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother Ron Tigner, he thinks it's good. And um, I've been praying for you and your family, but um, I, know I, I can't look your way because I know, I know that that was good. If you would look at Matthew chapter 5. If you would, Matthew chapter 5. Like the message of that song, because it... It moves us from just looking at Jesus to living for Jesus. If Jesus is all to us, then His righteousness, His holiness, His grace, His mercy will burn in our hearts as passion 
to live our lives for the purpose that He has left us here. Um, I, I use this illustration a lot, especially when I'm talking uh, to kids. And I don't know why, I, just particularly when kids, but if I'm speaking in a junior camp or kids, I don't know why anyone would have me come talk to their kids, but every now and then it happens. And uh, I'll, I'll use this idea. i say, have you ever thought about the fact that when Jesus saves us, He doesn't just take us to heaven? Like he doesn't, It's not like praying you pass the test. Because His purpose for us is not over. It, it's not like we say the right thing and pray and repent and believe in our hearts and trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior. And well, that's it. Now it's time to come on up. No, He leaves us for a purpose. And Jesus is going to speak some to that purpose today in Matthew chapter 5. And we're mainly going to focus, as I mentioned a moment ago, on verse number 13. Now verse 13 down through verse 20 is sort of a section. It's a portion of this Sermon on the Mount. And we've sort of introduced that by the Beatitudes, the blessings that Jesus speaks on these that are following Him. And so we know that He kind of begins the Sermon on the Mount totally contrary to what all all of these people were used to. We won't rehash it for time's sake this morning, but you remember the last few weeks we've <clears throat> read several different Jewish readings and Jewish teachers that would teach in this identical style 100, 150, 400 years before Jesus ever came. It was very common that as the Jewish people tried to restore the glory of their nation of Israel, that they had been defeated, they had been exiled and taken sort of around the world and just put through the ringer as a people. The Jerusalem, their capital, the temple, everything was destroyed. And as they would come back, they would be taught things by good-intentioned teachers that would say things like, blessed are, remember some of the ones from last week, blessed are those who uh, outlive their enemies, basically, who live to see the downfall of their enemies. Blessed are those who, when they speak, they have attentive listeners. They're important enough that when they speak, other people pay attention. Blessed are those who, and it talked about their family and their actions, their deeds, and who they were as people. And Jesus comes on the scene and teaches in a way the opposite. He says, you're not blessed because you've got your life together. You're not blessed because you're winning at life. You're not blessed because your circumstances are favorable. He says, blessed are people that realize, poor in spirit, that they have a need. Blessed are those that mourn over their sin because they realize that there's something wrong in their life. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness. Remember, hunger and thirsting is an indication that there's a lack. It's your body saying, I need food, I need drink, or I need water. And he's saying that recognize the need of their lives for righteousness. Blessed are those that are merciful. Blessed are those that are peacemakers. Blessed are and, uh, those that are persecuted. He walks through... And he basically validates everyone that's listening to him. He says, regardless of your circumstance, your household, your family, your job, your position, your influence, your authority, he's speaking to people from all over, regardless of what life has brought into your path so far, the Lord's blessing is on you. And why? He said, because I'm giving you the gospel. I'm giving you the truth the kingdom of heaven that is so vastly different from every kingdom of earth that man has ever known. You're getting that first. And he says, blessed are these. And then he walks through and we come to this one verse this morning. Now, I understand we have a church cookout this afternoon. If you didn't know that, surprise, and you're welcome. I mean, how much better could it get? You show up and we're going to have a cookout. So... When preparing, I said, we're just going to do one verse. Um, could, we can go eat. No, that's not it, but I figure we shouldn't try to tackle too much. It is a little ironic that just before our cookout, this one verse mentions the word salt three times and salted. Um, so we'll see, see how that goes. I want you to read verse 13 with me again. It says, you're the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savor... Wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. There's a lot of interpretations as to what Jesus is trying to emphasize here by describing his followers as salt. 
Now, some of you just finished school this week or in the next few weeks, and you know the difference. There's metaphors and similes. Similes say you are like whatever, or you are as, and uses those words. And metaphors is sort of a, a comparison, that there's a direct link between these two. And that's what he uses here, a metaphor. He says, you are the salt of the earth. And so there is something. Now, he is not literally teaching us that we are going to become actual salt, the chemical breakup of salt. He's saying that there's comparative quantities between the two. There are things that are alike, or there are the characteristics that both should have. And that's where a lot of study goes into, well, what did Jesus mean by we are the salt of the earth? And I could stand up here, I won't for time's sake. I stand up here and we could spend a whole lesson or sermon's worth on each of the qualities of salt that Jesus was, may have been referring to. There are a few that may have stuck out in these followers' mind. Remember, these are mostly Jewish people that are listening to Jesus, particularly those that he's beginning to call as his apostles or his disciples. And when he speaks the word salt, immediately, that would have been, that would have been a very good and refreshing thing for them. Now, let me give you, for example, in, in Bible day, or salt, or in Jesus' time, salt would have contained value. Uh, you have heard somebody's worth their salt. That actually came from this, that phrase came from this time period, referring to, started referring as to soldiers, a soldier that is worth his salt. Now, some have said that they were paid completely in salt. It's not. If you study a soldier, or, or even a normal worker, at times would choose to take part of their salary in salt because of the value of it. It wasn't as readily accessible and the things that it could do. And so there's great value to salt. And so when Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, immediately their minds would have thought, they're not thinking of some random table item that you pass around and put on french fries at McDonald's. There, It's a lot more to it than that. There's value to these ones that Jesus is speaking to. In fact, the word salary that we have, the Latin root there, the sol, is from the same word. It's the same word, salt. It means that there's value to it. In, in today's word, put it this way, you say, you are the gold of the earth. You have value. But it would mean more than that. Salt, of course, can preserve things. That's what they would have used it a lot for. They would rub it into meat, or they would salt ter- certain types of produce. Some of us would have lived very well in that day, um, would have really enjoyed certain meals and that kind of thing, but they would salt it, and then later they would go back and sort of soak it in water to try to pull that back out when they would actually go to cook it, and then they would bring it forth. So it, it had this preserving capabilities, and some have said, well, Jesus is referring to the preserving capabilities of salt, that we are to sort of preserve the earth from decaying any more than it has, like becoming more wicked than it has. And I, I, I see the sentiment there. It's not a horrible way of looking at it. There's really nowhere else in the Bible where it talks about salt as a preserving agent. And here's the truth. The world is corrupt already. We're not going to stop it from becoming corrupt. The hope for the world is not that Christians keep it from getting worse. That's not the hope for the world. The hope for the world is that Jesus Christ would radically transform and change the hearts of people. So the church is not called to keep things from getting worse. We are called to influence others for Christ. So that's one that they, some have looked at it as that salt brings flavor to things, that it makes, for, for some of us at least, it makes things more enjoyable, more palatable. Um, so some of you have ever been to someone's house and they served you a meal and um, you took a bite and this is not going to go down easy. And so you're like, just pass me anything possible and coat it with pepper take the bottom off of the salt shaker and dump it on there to just mask the flavor as you put it down. And some would say, well, Jesus is speaking to that element of salt and that we are kind of called to season the world and, and to make the world understand that there is something better, that Jesus Christ is better. And that's a good element to it as well. It's believers were uh, are supposed to be salt in the sense that it, it's a healing element, it's cleansing, it's 
an, an antiseptic of types that would have been used in their day. So when they hear the word salt, they think of value, flavor. They think of preserving things. They think of healing things or wounds or, or, or kind of holding back infection. And so it's sort of like we are called to sort of help heal, in a way, the sins of the world. And all of those are fine ways to handle it, but I think maybe the best way to handle our interpretation of this verse is to just really refocus on what Jesus says. Notice again, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? Let, let's break down what he's saying. You are salt. If salt has lost its savor, that's, have you ever, what taste is salt? Like nobody, can, it's a very difficult thing. It's not sweet, but other than that, it's kind of difficult to describe. It's just, it's, it is a flavor. It's salt. It's salty. And so when he says the savor, he's saying, talking about there, the flavor, the thing that makes it salty, right? And salt can actually lose its flavor or savor. I don't know if you've ever kept salt in somewhere that is, is very humid. Um, and and it, the salt, the, the, I don't know all the chemical compound and how it breaks down, but it can actually evaporate away. So then you just are left with these kind of crystal, then at that point, useless little balls of stuff, little, you just shake it on there. We went to, we rented a, a cabin kind of area one time. It's more rustic, no air conditioning kind of thing up in the mountains. And so it had sat for a long time and they had a salt shaker on the table. And I guess over time, it, the, the house would get humid because nobody was there. And then it would evaporate when it would turn on and humid and back and forth. And so we sat down and went to put it on something that we were eating. And I was like, man, this doesn't taste right. So put a little more on there. And it got to where I, I could actually see it on my food. And I still, I could not taste it. So finally I poured it in my hand and I tried it. It had no flavor. So when Jesus says, if salt has lost its savor, its flavor, that's really what he is speaking to here. That's evidently what he really has in mind, is if it's lost that, what purpose does it have? And so that's really what we're going to focus on this morning. But I want you to think in comparison, we'll go one verse further. Look at verse 14. It says, you are the salt, you are the salt of the earth, verse 13. Verse 14, you're the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Verse 16, let your light so shine before men. Now, he's speaking here two different metaphors. He's salt and light. Usually they're kind of taken together. If you have a pastor that, is, that doesn't dabble maybe quite as long as I do, they can handle both of these in the same sermon. We're just going to do one salt this morning. But no matter how you look at your interpretation of what Jesus is really trying to get across from salt, preserving, healing, uh, value, food, flavor, whatever it is that you're saying that it is. They would even use it to sort of destroy crops at times and wheat that, or, or fields where there were weeds and different things, and they would spread salt across it so nothing could grow for a certain amount. There's all sorts of ways you can look at it. But here's the point about salt. I've said the word salt so many times it makes me uncomfortable. It's a weird word. Here's, here's what Jesus is pointing out about salt, right? It has influence. Don't miss that. Don't focus so deeply on its flavor, its value, its ability to clean something, its ability to preserve something. Here's the point. Salt changes whatever it comes in contact with. Salt influences Light, the same thing. Light changes wherever it enters. It changes from darkness to light. It's visible. So in my opinion, as humble as I may try to make it, here, here is really what Jesus is trying to get across in these verses about salt and light, that we are called to influence the world. You cannot miss that. And that we are called to be the light of the world, meaning we are called to be visible to the world. Now, sometimes we handle this passage and these two verses, just to be quite frank, we handle them improperly. Because here's what we kind of point out. We say, well, salt, it's different than the world. It's so different that it is distinct. And light compared to darkness is so different than darkness that we are to be different. And what we take in the focus of these two verses is if we're salt and we are light, we are to be nothing like the world. Well, that's obvious. That's obvious that he's saying that we're different. 
But if you take these two verses or these two illustrations in these verses and you get to the place where you say, the church is called to be different from the world, and you stop there and you leave this passage alone, I think we've missed completely what Jesus is trying to teach. That is, that is an element, one element of what Jesus is teaching when he says, yes, be salt, be light, be different from the world. But if you get there and you come to that part in your mind and heart and you take that as a lesson and you stop, you've missed what Jesus is bringing up. You know, I think I can prove it. Look at verse 13 again. It is salt of the earth, but if the salt hath lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and be trodden under foot of men. In other words, he's saying, if salt loses the ability to influence, it has no purpose. Being distinct, being different, is not the goal that Jesus is pointing out, though it's part of it, it's how we do it. Look, if you would, and you can check your notes, there's mainly just two points today, you can look at those as we walk through. I want you to notice, number one, two things that Jesus is emphasizing. Number one, he emphasizes identity. And he does that in the very first phrase. He says, you, ye, you are the salt of the earth. It's very easy language. You equal this. You are this. And he's speaking here to identity. A lot of these things would have come to mind. When, when he said, you are the salt of the earth, sure, they could... Um, they could think of gold, they could think of a catalyst, they could think of medicine, they could think of seasoning, they could think of preserving, and all these are, again, they're pretty good applications, but notice how he emphasizes it first. He starts with this, this is what you are. He doesn't phrase it by saying, I'm giving you salt. He doesn't say, you're going to have salt for the earth. He doesn't instruct us to go salt the earth with something else. He says, you are the salt of the earth. Who you are is going to do what God wants you to do. And I think this is an emphasis that we often lose. We, we so focus sometimes on what we do and the list of things that we are supposed to accomplish as Christians that we miss what we are supposed to be. Look at the Beatitudes. Look, look back, verses 3 through verse number 12. We won't read them all. What action? Blessed are those that are poor in spirit. Blessed are those that mourn. Blessed are those that are meek, that hunger, that are merciful, that are pure, that are peacemakers, that are persecuted. Which of those things is like a list of accomplishments? None of them. Because Jesus is first calling his disciples to be and to become before he ever calls them to do. Because if you are what you are supposed to be, then you will do what you are supposed to do. But there is a way in a Christian's life in which you can do what you're supposed to do and not be who you're supposed to be. You know what it's called? Hypocrisy. Jesus talks about it a lot. When you do what you're supposed to get done, and when in front of people and in the public element, you don't break the rules. But in your head and your heart and in your mind, you're far from him. How many times does Jesus, how many times does God talk about it all through the Old Testament, but even Jesus? These people, they serve us, they talk about me, they worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. He tells Saul, he says, I don't care about your sacrifices anymore. It's your heart that has run away from me. And so when Jesus says, blessed are these people, he says, if this is what you are, then by your very element, you are the salt of the earth. You're going to influence. Notice a couple of things that we've pointed out. The impact that the Christian has on the world begins first and foremost with who they are in Christ, not what they do. And don't hear me wrong. I'm not saying what you do doesn't matter. But what you do is supplemental. It's secondary to who Christ is making you. You cannot be what Jesus wants you to be without Jesus, without the gospel radically transforming your life. And notice, it goes further, Jesus has just spoken the Beatitudes like we read. He's talking about what his followers are. You cannot and should not separate these two things. 
The idea that salt is Jesus is teaching, the big idea that Jesus is teaching about salt here is its effect on other things. It changes things. You say, well, I choose the preservation interpretation here. He's preserving. Well, right. It changes it from something that will rot quickly to something that won't. Well, I choose that he's talking about flavor. Right. It changes it. It, it turns it to something different. You think about, about its healing element. Yes, whatever it comes in contact with, it changes it. And Jesus is saying, when you are who you're supposed to be as a Christian, you will change the world through the power of Jesus Christ. God has never chosen to change the world by simply the action of Christians. Why? Because he's not necessarily just in that. His spirit indwells us as people, and he uses people then to impact and change the world. Notice the focus or the influence of salt here points us not to the differences, or the details of our difference from the world. That's not what he teaches here, but our likeness to Christ. The passage does not just focus on teaching us ways to be different from the world first. It focuses first on the heart and mind of Jesus Christ. There's too many things that you could put on a list. You say, well, how can we be salt to the earth? We need to be different than the world. We need to be different than the earth. And that's, that's an okay way of trying. But eventually, you know what you're going to find? Your list is going to go into the thousands and into the millions of ways that you're going to try to be different. But here's what Jesus is teaching. If you will be like me, you will be exactly as different as I want you to be. You'll be different in all the ways that I want you to be. If you focus on being like and in Jesus Christ, you will be starkly different from the world. There will be no accident. It's like sometimes we get this idea that like, well, I'll try to follow Jesus in the gospel and I'll try to follow these things, but I really need to pay attention to what the world is doing and what the world is like so that I can be different. Jesus is promising you, follow me. And men will hate and revile you. They will despitefully use you. They will talk about you. They will persecute you. Not because you're like them, but because you're different. And Jesus says, keep your focus and your eyes on who I am and what I've called you to be. Sometimes as Christians, we get so hyper-focused on everyone and everything else that our eyes and our gaze have left Jesus in the first place. So you know what we then become? We just try to become like the best of humanity, which is depraved and sinful. But he says, hey, follow me and you'll be as different. It's your identity. It's who you are before just what you do. But then notice the rest of the verse is a warning. Verse number 13 again. He says, you are the salt of the earth. And sometimes we, we read into that statement and talk all about that, and we skip the bulk of the verse, which is a warning. If the salt have lost its savor, if it stops being this, you are the salt of the earth. If you stop being the salt of the earth, if you stop being like Christ, if you stop being these things in the Beatitudes, if you stop being the rest of the, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7, he's going to teach us that as we walk through. He's going to say, here's if this is what you are, then this is how you ought to live. So there is an element of what we do, but it comes out of who we are. He says that if you lose that, where, how's it going to become salty again? Wherewith shall it be salted? Like, like, what do you put on salt to make it salty? That's the question he's at. That's literally the question he's asking. If Christians, all right, let's, let's say that he's saying, if you, Christians, you're the salt of the earth. If you Christians stop being Christians, how are you, who's going to make you like Christ? How are you going to be salted? And he says, if you cease being what you're supposed to be, what happens? He says, it's a, it's a stark warning. It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. Now, there's a lot of ways we can say this. And typically, here's the way that sometimes this verse is handled. We've stopped being salty as Christians. We titled this Sanctified Saltiness this morning. Some of you are like, I have been a salty person 
just, t- I, I have that part down. Some of us, I know I do at times. I can be salty in my personality at times. And so that's not what he's teaching us here. But as you look at this, notice again, this is the, this is the focus, this is the warning. Salt that is not salty has no purpose. Well, how do you know that it's not salt anymore? Think about that. So the, the purpose of this verse is not saying you're not different enough anymore, so you stop being salty. No, here's how you know salt doesn't work. And by no, it doesn't taste like salt anymore. It, here's, here's, the, here's the basic element. It doesn't change anything. It doesn't influence anything. It has no impact. It has no influence. And when that happens, it's good for nothing. He's not saying here, as long as you're different from the world, you're being who I want you to be. That's not what he's teaching. That's part of it, but it's not the whole. Here's how he measures it. You're the salt of the earth, which means what? You flavor things, you change things, you impact things, you preserve, you cleanse, you heal. But if you don't impact the earth, the salt of the, don't miss that focus, of the earth, (laughs) the salt that changes the earth, the world, and if you don't impact, you have no purpose, no point. You're good to be thrown out and walked over like a gravel sidewalk. That's it. Not polite is how we would phrase this at table talk. We wouldn't go down to our cookout in a few minutes and be like, well, what have you accomplished this week? Well, I kind of had the week, I had a couple days off and just got some routine things. <laughs> Walk over you like carpet. It would be a fairly significant statement, right, to make. But I want you to think about, here's what Jesus is saying. You're the salt of the earth. You're salt because you're here to change it, to change the world by being in Jesus Christ. And if you've stopped changing it, if you've stopped influencing it, you've lost your whole purpose. That's it. That, that's the lesson. Let's close and go home. We will in just a moment. But that's it. I mean, it's a simple lesson that Jesus is teaching. And I don't think I have to say a whole lot to make this sit in, to make it sink in. Some of us have got all the other parts of being a Christian down. But the changing and influencing the world part, it's like we can take it or leave it. But Jesus begins his earthly ministry with this sermon saying, you're the salt of the earth. You're the ones that I've called. And when I leave this earth physically, through you spiritually, I'm going to change the world through you. But when you stop influencing others, you've lost your purpose. Notice what he says in verse, uh, and the second thing there, there is, There's an assumption here that salt must contact something to influence it. Okay, I'm going to try to do this by a a simple illustration. I went down before the service and got this little dessert plate, right? Here's a piece of bread. It's old and stale. Okay, we are the salt of the earth, right? We're supposed to change. We're supposed to impact. Now, everybody watch, careful. Here's this piece of bread. Uh, This is the world. I'm supposed to change and impact the world. Here is me. I'm the salt of the earth. Now, I'm not a big packet fan. I'm more of a jar fan. But for time's sake, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to impact the earth. This is what Jesus has called me to be. Watch. I'm going to change the earth. I'm doing so good changing the earth aren't I? Oh, here's, here's the world. I need, we are called to influence and change the world. Some of you are, some of you are hyperventilating because I put salt on it. How awesome is this? Changing the world for Jesus. But I have no contact with it. Can't influence it. Can't flavor it. Can't preserve it can't cleanse it unless my life touches it. I'll even move it here. Now I'm really close to it. 
That bread is no saltier than it was when we started, is it? It hasn't changed at all. Because the thing that was called to change it never touched it. I want you to ask yourself in your mind right now, how do you contact the world? How do you touch it? Who? I'm a big fan. There's some, I don't even know where it came from. There's somebody who talks about the element of the second question. Always ask a sec- second question. How, how am I impacted? Well, let's ask another question. Who? Who in the world are you impacting? It's great to impact our kids and our spouse. It's great to impact those in our church. But I didn't say you're the salt of the church. You're the salt of the earth. They're the ones that deeply need to be changed. And when he calls us, but I have no contact. Think, you say, well, what bearing do you have on this? We're called to come out from among them and be separate. Well, that verse is actually just talking about doing gospel work with people that are unsaved. He says that's impossible. Impossible. He says, I have a pretty good example. Here's, here's one. The Word, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the word was God. But then what happened? Here was all these people in sin. Jesus is the word, right? Here he is with God in heaven. You know how he changed them? He yelled really loudly from heaven. He didn't do that. He started a blog and hoped that maybe the earth would read it. He threw a track on the door of the earth. He spread them Like it rained rain and manna from heaven, it rained tracks one day, and that's how the gospel got here. No, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal to God, but made himself of no reputation, right? Became the form of a servant and was made into the likeness of men. Jesus impacted, influenced, because he touched the world. And we as Christians are called to be the salt of the earth, which means what? We are to influence people. Well, how can I do that? It's more than a click and a tap or a vote in the ballot box. All those are great things. There's actual life-to-life contact that has to happen. So you seem passionate about this this morning. I am. You know why? Because I realized not too long ago, within the last year or two, that I stink at this. Because I'm really good at making my own little place where I never have to come in contact or touch anything outside of my element. You know, I, I started forcing myself to try to have conversations, and it's uncomfortable. For, I tried to force myself to have conversations with people, enter into the hard situations of life. There's some circumstances I've been kind of called into that I really would rather avoid. I've kind of started going to certain places. Now, I'm not like going to the nasty seed. He's not saying go be a part of the sin of the earth, but he's saying you have to touch it to change it. And I want you to notice as we close, notice what it says, Salt that lacks saltiness or does not contact the world is useless. Useless. That's not my word. That's Jesus' word. It has no purpose. It's going to be thrown out. Ultimately, it's disregarded and will go unnoticed because it has no influence and no impact. We'll finish with this and we'll be done. I'm going to put a couple little things up here. I'll set this to the side. Here's who we are as Christians. We have our identity as Christians, right? I am a Christian. What does that mean? And we won't spend time this morning to define it, but here I am. Here's, here is me. I am a Christian. That's great. It talks about identity. You are the salt of the earth. But you know what else it talks about? It also talks about our mission. And there's both elements. Here's what I am. Here's my purpose. But you know what we do sometimes is we separate and we take our identity and we put it in a place that makes us comfortable. Well, I'm going to destroy a cello. I'll put it here. (laughs) And we separate them, right? 
here's our identity, and here's my mission. I usually get the identity right, and when I remember it or I feel bad or I'm really motivated, I accomplish my mission. But these two things were never meant to be separated. Who I am in Christ is never meant to be separated from the purpose that he has for me. They are one in the same. But for some reason as Christians, we think we're successful when we get this part right, even if this part is not being done. But Jesus says this, you're salt, you're here to influence. If you don't, you have no purpose. Let's bow our head and close our eyes this morning. It may seem like Well, I say, well, this verse seems so much more harsh than I remember it being. He's not trying to speak harshly. Think about what he calls us to do to impact the world. Blessed are those that are poor in spirit, people that mourn, people that are meek, merciful, pure in heart, people that are peacemakers, that care for others, that hunger and thirst for righteousness and for justice, people that are persecuted even when they're misunderstood. This is how you change the world. But you can't change it unless you contact it, unless you touch it in some way. And we're good at building walls up around our lives so that we have no contact. Jesus has called us to quite the opposite. Father, thank you for your word to us. We praise you for your mercy. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Stand if you would. I'm going to read you something, then we'll do an invitation. We'll sing this song.